Good morning, guys, and welcome to Pauline Baptist Church Online Edition. Happy Labor Day weekend. We're so thankful that you joined us this morning. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we are so thankful, again, that you joined us. I have a couple announcements uh, and then some verses I want to share with you just before we jump into worship. Uh, it is September the 6th. Next Sunday, we're going to have a uh, regular quarterly business meeting, September the 13th. That'll be immediately following um, our 1045 worship service. We'll hold that meeting uh, there in the gym. Got several important things that we're going to discuss uh, leading into the next uh, month, including uh, a recommendation from the personnel committee about uh, our interim pastor, uh, as well as uh, Pastor James's transition out. Uh, you should have already received a packet via email if you're on our email list. Uh, if you haven't received that, please feel free to contact us uh, at any time and we'll forward that on to you. Uh, we would love for you to take a look through the agenda, through some of the recommendations this uh, next week and visit with either the either the appropriate committee or any of our staff about any of the business uh, meeting items. But that's September the 13th after the 1045 uh, worship service. So that's coming up. Now, I realize you're at home and you may be planning or thinking about and praying about uh, coming back to in-person worship in the next few weeks. Uh, we sent out a uh, September worship guide. And so again, if you don't have a copy of that, please let us know. We'd love to forward that uh, to you. In it, we've uh, outlined some of the 
precautions, some of the things that we're looking about, looking at and thinking about for our in-person gatherings. Uh, one of the things that we would love to remind you uh, is to wear your mask. Wear your mask if you are uh, coming to in-person service as you're entering the building. Um, we would love for you, if you're comfortable, to wear that through the service, uh, but it is not required. Uh, and then we'd love for you, as you're leaving the building, until you get to your car, get out to the open air to wear that mask, uh, just to be uh, conscious and careful around uh, the other people uh, with us. Now, I would say this, if you're planning on returning and you've got uh, some concerns, or maybe you're a little more cautious than uh, some others, and want to attend a service that is uh, where most people are wearing masks, at least uh, before and after, I'd encourage you to come to the 830 service. Uh, most of our attendees during that time are wearing masks. It is uh, very socially distant during that time at 830. So we'd encourage you to do that. We'd love for you to take a look at some of those precautions and protocols. In it is a list of Sunday school classes, uh, things that are coming up, Wednesday night ministries, uh, and outlining what that's going to look like for the month of September. And so, of course, as we uh, monitor the numbers and we watch your attendance, uh, we are going to respond uh, as best we can. Uh, but we would just encourage you that if you've been exposed or you feel cautious or you are immune compromised, we just encourage you to stay home and join us online uh, like you are this morning. And so that's September and that worship guide. Again, if you don't have a copy of that, let us know. We'd love to share that with you. Uh, one item for for prayer. Uh, of course, we'd love for you to pray about all of this, uh, but we have all conference scheduled uh, October the 1st and 2nd, and this is designed for pastors and church leaders. And typically we have uh, pastors, at least in the last couple of years, come from around the country uh, to join us for a time of encouragement and uh, uh, sharpening, and uh, we're planning on having it uh, those days. Of course, there's going to be probably fewer in attendance, but we'd love for you to pray because we do uh, want to encourage those that would come into attendance. And we do, as a, as a staff, want to encourage, we want to love on those pastors. And so would you pray for all conference, October 1st and 2nd. We'll share a few more details. Of course, you're welcome to attend any of the sessions, and we'll let you know that schedule. But we wanted to let you know that was coming up and ask you to pray for that. Now, as we head into worship, I'd love to read uh, verses out of Luke uh, chapter 11. Uh, Luke chapter 11, and this is Jesus speaking and says, so I tell you, this is verse 9, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. He says keep on three times there, so that must be important. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be open. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you, sinful fathers, or people, it says here, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And I think that's just such a great reminder that we can continue to seek. If we'll seek after the Lord, if we'll keep on asking, keep on seeking, uh, that the Lord answers our prayer. He says he gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. I remember as a little kid when my little sister Robin was getting ready, uh, was in the mom was in the hospital and, and Robin was about to be born. Uh, it was uh, the week at McDonald's that they were giving away the Hot Wheels car that I wanted. And I was so mad that I wasn't going to be able to go to McDonald's, but I kept begging and begging and begging and asking and asking and asking to go to McDonald's just to get that car. And uh, of course, obviously now I understand what's a, what, what a big moment that was. Uh, but I just remember that my dad uh, and my uncle and, and my aunt taking me to McDonald's just to get that silly, uh, that silly car. Um, but that's what it's saying here is if we we seek and we knock and we keep on seeking, we keep on uh, asking the Lord, the Lord will give us the Holy Spirit and he knows exactly what we have need of before we even ask. And it says that he gives, how much more will your heavenly father give uh, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I'd love to pray and I'm going to turn it over to the guys in worship. Um, Brother Larry is going to be preaching this uh, Sunday. He's actually on the schedule for the month of September, so we'll pray for him. Uh, each of the guys will be taking uh, a month in the next few months as we uh, look to towards uh, hiring our next pastor. But uh, Brother Larry is up uh, this month, and we're looking forward to hearing what God 
uh, has to say through him. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather. Uh, even if it's online, we know that your Holy Spirit can, can bind us together, can unite us, and you can speak to us through your word. And through Brother Larry, I pray that you give him words and wisdom. Father, I pray that you are honored by our lives as we continue to seek you, as we keep on seeking you. Father, would you just give us your... Uh, um, more of your word and, and more of a, an awareness of what you want to, us to do with our lives and in our lives and through our lives. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you're honored by our worship. That we pray that you're honored by our lives as we, as we respond to your word this morning. So, Father, we do thank you for this time. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.
Glad you tuned in today. And we're going to hear from God today. And I'm not talking about myself. I am talking about this. And I hope you've had a great week and are today preparing to just spend a little bit of time, a few minutes in the Word of God. I want to talk to you about things that should make us thankful. And my remarks are going to be based on Colossians chapter 1. And so if you can get your Bibles, 
I would appreciate it if you would find your word, find the scripture, um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, right there is where we are. Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Then he begins with his thanksgiving. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard, in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. I want you to think with me for a few minutes about, about things that make us thankful. Do you know that the things that make you thankful reveal a lot about your heart? When we were, uh, my children were young and we would come to Christmas. I remember, I don't know how many times it happened, but it happened a lot of times that, that we would buy, Pat and I would buy our, our children gifts and put them, you know, they would be in boxes. And uh, so Christmas morning, they would open their gifts and you look down and here you've got this expensive gift that they have laid aside and are playing with the box. They're playing with the box, not with the toy, but with the box. The reason they do that is because uh, the box is more fun and they understand how boxes work. But I think the reason they do that is that they lack maturity and they don't understand the value of things. And so to them, what's in the box is no more valuable than the box and the box looks more fun. Sometimes I think as Christians, we are playing with the box. We don't value the things and we're not as thankful. We're not as thankful as we ought to be for the things that are really, really important. In fact, um, sometimes we tend to be more thankful for just material things. I mean, we're thankful for a house and a car and a job and comforts and don't misunderstand, I'm thankful for those things too but we need to be more thankful for the spiritual things in our lives. Like for instance, uh, for eternal life, for salvation, for the promise of heaven forever and ever, for our fellowship together. Man, that is something we ought to be thankful for. For the gospel of Jesus Christ, for God's word that we can read, for eternal security of the believer, for the Holy Spirit who indwells us. All of these things, are very, very important for which we ought to be constantly thanking God because we have them and because they make such a difference. When Paul began to write the Colossians, he said, he begins this way, and you can read it in your Bibles in verse one and two. Paul and Timothy to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Now, I think we need to understand the source of this letter. And of course, the source of the letter is Paul himself. Paul was writing the letter. Paul, when he wrote this, was imprisoned in Rome, not for doing something wrong, but for doing something that God called him to do, for being a minister of the gospel, for preaching the truth in Christ, for refusing to bow to Caesar, for teaching and preaching that Jesus Christ is the only savior and a Christian cannot have two saviors, only one, and that is Jesus. And because he preached that so strongly, he was imprisoned in Rome. He wrote this letter to the saints in Colossae and he wrote several prison epistles, they're called, letters from prison. And it's interesting to me that he never once said, pray for me that I'll get out of prison. It was terrible to be imprisoned in those days. It wasn't like today where there are nice sanitary conditions and showers and good meals and air conditioning and those things. It was not that way. In Paul's day, to be in prison was to be in a dank prison cell. It was not to have good light. It was not to have good food. It was to, 
to curtail all of your experiences in this one place. And Paul never once said, would you pray for me that I get out of prison? Let me tell you what he did tell them. He did ask them to pray. In fact, he asked the Colossians to pray. If you have your Bibles and want to turn over with me in uh, the book of Colossians chapter four and verse number three, here's what he said. He said, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak for the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison. Isn't that something? The only thing he asked them to pray for him about was that he would have boldness to speak the gospel. He said, it's the reason I'm in prison, but he said, I'm not stopping. And he said, would you pray for me? That's interesting because Paul was in prison as he wrote this. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is he wrote to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Saints means just means somebody who is set apart. <clears throat> the Bible teaches, especially the New Testament teaches that a saint is not somebody who has a halo around their head, not somebody who goes around like this, but a saint is a person who has been set apart because they've been saved by the grace of God They've asked Christ to save them and God has set them apart. They are saints. They are set apart for him. And so Paul is writing this letter to the saints who are at Colossae. He also said, I'm writing this to the faithful brethren. This word faithful is a beautiful little word and it, it's always used exclusively for believers in Christ. When the New Testament talks about somebody who is faithful, he's talking about somebody it is talking about somebody who is in Christ. And then that brings us to the third little thing here. Paul is writing to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. To be a brother means to be, literally it means to be born of the same womb. If you have a physical brother or sister, it's somebody who, who has the same mother or the same father, somebody who is physically similar to you, they're from the same womb. When you put that onto the Christian life. He says, listen, I'm writing to brethren in Christ. These men and women in Colossae were Paul's brethren because they were born again of the Spirit of God. God was their father. Christ was their savior. They were brothers in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and this, this idea of being brethren in Christ, it, it belongs to those who have, who have gone through the new birth who have been born again into the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ. There's one other little thing that we want to note, and that is that Paul is writing to these people that were in a church in Colossae, Colossae, who were at Colossae. Now, there's something that's kind of neat right here. I want you to see it. He says they're, they are in Christ at Colossae. Here's their spiritual location. Their, their spiritual address, where they are spiritually, they're in Christ. They've been born again. Where they are physically, they're at Colossae. They're in the city of Colossae. And every one of us have a spiritual and physical address. If you're a believer in Christ, you are in him at Monticello or at Little Rock or wherever you live. You're in Christ, but in a physical place. Here at Colossae means the church, the group of people who were meeting who have been saved, baptized, born again, who are there. Now, I have a map that I, I can't get away from. I love this monitor, using a monitor. I do it on Wednesday nights. Because he say, wait a minute, Colossae, we're in the world. And this is what is modern day Turkey. You can see some of the cities, Jerusalem, Damascus, Antioch. And where he's writing to, he's writing from Rome to the people in Colossae. Colossae is about a hundred miles from the city of Ephesus. Paul had never been to Colossae. He makes that clear. He hasn't, they hadn't seen his face, but he's writing this letter from there to them. He had spent three years in the city of Ephesus. In fact, when he was in Ephesus, the Bible says <clears throat> in the book of Acts that, that all of Asia Minor heard the gospel when Paul was in Ephesus. He was there for three years preaching the gospel every day. And Epaphras, who is mentioned in verse seven, was one of the ones who probably came to Ephesus and was saved, who went back to Colossae, his hometown, and began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
because he was saved. He came to know Christ. He went back to his hometown and began to talk to them about it. In fact, you say, where does it say that? Well, it says it in verse seven. Paul said, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant who is faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. <clears throat> and so what we need to see is that they're in that place, the church is there because Epaphras had been changed by the gospel of Christ. Now listen, when this letter was written, Epaphras also was a prisoner with Paul in Rome. In fact, that's why he calls him our beloved fellow prisoner, our beloved fellow bond servant who is a servant of Christ. And so it's important for us to understand that when Paul wrote this letter, he was writing to these people in Colossae, even though he hadn't been there and he's encouraging them. And he's saying, I just thank God for you for several different reasons. And that's what we're going to, we're going to talk about just right for a few minutes. Uh, what do you think it was that moved Paul to give such thanks to God? His prayer for the Colossians are an example that we can follow. In fact, in verse number three in your Bibles, he said, we give thanks to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. You know, in these verses, we see, we're reminded that, the, that we are to be thankful. We are to give thanks. Just like Paul was thankful for them, we are also to give thanks. Now, what was Paul thankful for? Well, there were four things he mentions, and I think they, they're a good example for us. We also can be thankful for these very same things. The first thing he mentions, we should be thankful for, for faith in Christ, faith in Christ Jesus. He said, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, Paul had not been to Colossae. He didn't know them, but he was thankful that they came to faith in Jesus Christ. He was thankful that they knew him. In fact, in chapter two, verse one, if you look over across the page, Paul said, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf to the Colossians and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. He had not been there, but he was concerned about them and he was thankful that they had come to faith in Christ. It's an amazing thing to me that wherever I go around the world, around the United States, that when I meet other children of God, other people that know the Lord Jesus, when I meet people that are saved, there is an instant bond that takes place. I may not have met them 10 minutes ago, but if they know Jesus and I know Jesus and we're believers, we have the same father in heaven. We have the same savior in our Lord Jesus. And there is a, there's an instant bond there. And so Paul is talking about that. He said, I haven't met you, but I'm so thankful for your faith in Jesus Christ that you have come to faith in him. Now, are you thankful for your faith in Christ Jesus? Many of us would say absolutely without a doubt. I am so thankful to be saved. Several years ago here at Pauline Church, um, when I was pastoring, we had some, <laughs> when I first became the pastor here, I met some of the folks as you always do. And I met a lady named Mary Locke, L-O-C-K-E. As the people were going out the door, I met uh, Ms. Sister Locke. I met some outlaws, uh, Gary and Linda. I also met some crooks, Selma Crook and other crooks. And it's kind of neat because I said, I told uh, Brother Gary and some of them that I said, you know, well, where you've got crooks and outlaws, you need locks. That was a terrible joke. That was a terrible, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, Sister Locke was one of these special, special people that loved, oh man, she loved Jesus so much that when we would have a testimony service, that's where people just stand up and just tell what they're thankful for. I can picture in my mind because she would do it every time. Every time we would have a testimony service, she would be the first one to stand up and she would always stand up and say, I want, I want everyone to know how thankful I am that Jesus saved me. Now she wouldn't say a lot. She didn't preach a sermon, but she would just say, I want you to know that I am thankful that Jesus saved me. You know, that's what we're talking about right here. We ought to be thankful for faith in Christ Jesus. The second thing that he mentions in verse four also is that we ought to be thankful for 
love for the saints. He said this in verse four. He said, not only for should, are we thankful for their faith in Christ Jesus, but also for the love which you have for all the saints. The Colossians loved others in the gospel. They loved others who were saved. And Paul knew that. Paul no doubt had heard from them, from Epaphras, his fellow prisoner who was from Colossae. And no doubt Epaphras told him all about the church in Colossae, where no doubt Epaphras is the one who carried the message and began to lead them to Christ and the church was organized. And so Paul had heard about them and now he is praying for them. He said, I'm thankful for your faith in Christ and I'm thankful for the love that you have for all the saints. The people who have been set apart to God, to God are saints. They are loved by God, set apart for him. And he said, I'm thankful that you love all of them. Man, there's something about it that just is amazing that you can sit wherever you are in your church and here where I happen to be in Monticello, Arkansas, in our church, we can pray and hold up people in Christ who are on the other side of the world, in China or in Indonesia or in the Philippines. And we can just pray for them and we can love them and not even really having been close to them physically because of the love that we have for the saints, for other believers in Christ. Um, our love for other believers, in fact, is an evidence of saving faith. John wrote this. He said, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. There is that bond in Christ, that love in Christ that is almost instantaneous among God's people, that even when you don't speak the same language, there is a love there that transcends language itself with other believers in Christ. And that's what he was talking about. It also denotes a concern for others. When, when Paul said, well, I'm thankful for your love for all the saints. He was telling them, I am thankful that you care about others outside of your fellowship, outside of your church, that you love all the saints. You have a love for all the saints. And, and this is so important that we not become so localized that we only love our brethren. It reminds me, my pastor used to talk about, my pastor used to talk about um, a prayer that somebody would pray. And this guy would pray, God bless me and my wife, my son, John, and his wife, these four and no more. Amen. There's some people that kind of pray like that. I mean, their, their prayers are so limited, but here he's talking about the love which you have for all the saints. Now that brings us to the third thing uh, that he was thankful for and for which we ought to be thankful. We ought to be thankful for faith in Christ Jesus, for love for the saints. We also ought to be thankful for the hope that we have in heaven. And he mentions this in verse five. He said, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of the truth and word of truth, the gospel because they knew Jesus and they were saved, they had a hope in heaven. They had a hope that went beyond this life. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Yeah, our hope in Christ goes beyond the grave and it goes beyond this life. Because they knew Jesus and they were saved, they had a hope for them that was laid up in heaven. Did you see that, how he said, because of the hope laid up for you. <laughs> and that means it's in a secure place. Uh, when something is laid up, it's protected, it's guarded, it is kept there, it's out of danger. In fact, it's amazing that we can live here and walk the face of this earth and have a hope that is in heaven. I hope you don't lose your hope. That's redundant. I pray you don't lose the hope you have in Christ, in heaven, because we have a hope, in fact, in this life that goes beyond the grave. Now, I want you to notice some particular things in this verse that are just amazing. He said, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, there are four facts about the gospel that he shares with them here. Um, do you remember how you heard the gospel? when somebody presented you the gospel, do you remember maybe you were young, maybe you were in Sunday school. For me, it was the first time I ever heard it clearly. Uh, Evelyn Hines was teaching my Sunday school class when I was 11 years old and she explained clearly the gospel, what I needed to do to be saved. And I was not saved at the time, but she explained it. 
and said, here's what you need to do. You need to repent of your sins and you need to, to believe in Christ only. You need to trust him to save your soul. And, and that's a personal commitment to him. And I remember when I heard the gospel and he shares here four facts about the gospel. He said, first of all, the gospel is good news about Jesus Christ. It brings us the hope of heaven. We don't have a hope of heaven. Man, have you been to a cemetery lately? There's not much hope there. When you look only at this life, this life only, there's no hope of heaven. But in Christ, we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. We have a hope for heaven. The second thing he said, of which you previously heard. The gospel is something that can be heard. People must be told about the gospel, about Christ, about salvation. They must be told about it. They don't just know it. They don't imagine it. They have to hear it. In fact, if it can be spoken, if it can be heard, it can be spoken and it needs to be spoken. In fact, when we come to trust him as savior, it was because it is because we have heard the gospel. And I love that the way he puts that. Then I want you to notice the third thing he said. He said, when you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel is not only the good news about Jesus Christ, it's not only something that can be heard, but it's also something that is true. It is the word of truth. It is true truth. The gospel is true according to the word of God. It is the same and it saves souls and it'll make a difference in your life. The gospel is the word of truth. And then finally, he says, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel is a message of God's grace. In the very next verse, he says this, the grace, it is the grace of God in truth. And so what I'm telling you is this, we ought to be thankful for our faith in Christ, for the hope uh, that we are for the love that we have for others, for the hope that we have in heaven. And then also finally, the fourth thing, we ought to be thankful for the fruit of sharing the gospel. Paul put it this way in verse six. He said, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. The fruit of sharing the gospel <clears throat> is more and more people coming to faith in Christ. When a person shares the gospel, they tell somebody what they need to do to be saved and that person is saved, that is considered fruit, the fruit of sharing the gospel, the fruit of the gospel. And when that person tells another person, then there's more fruit that goes on. In fact, when he said this, I love it. He said, the gospel which has come to you, the gospel has come to you as it is in all the world constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Now, when the gospel comes to you, it comes from the voice of someone, from the life of someone, from the words of someone who shares that, that, that loving truth. And then he also said, it's also come into all the world. When the gospel is shared, people will be saved. And this is a gospel for the world. It isn't only a gospel for America. It is only a gospel for a few people. The scripture makes it clear that this scripture gospel that saves souls is to go into all the world. That's the reason we send missionaries. That's the reason there are people even today, well, we're meeting here in church. There are people all around the world who are meeting and they're presenting the gospel, the sa salvation of souls. And they're trying to tell people about Christ who can save them and give them heaven for sure. The gospel goes out into all the world. And then I want you to notice also that it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. The Colossians had heard and believed the gospel. They continually shared the gospel. The gospel was going out and it was going out into all the world. And he said, listen, it is constantly bearing fruit. It's not you who bear the fruit. It's the gospel that you share that bears the fruit. We're not responsible to save anybody. I couldn't save a person. I couldn't save myself. I sure can't save anyone else, but I can do some, one thing. I can tell people about Christ and about the saving gospel and he can save them. And when they come to faith in Christ, that they're the fruit of the gospel. And he says, listen, the fruit is being born. It is increasing. It is constantly going into all the world. One of the things the Bible talks about really clearly in the New Testament especially is that in the New Testament, 
in the Bible, great churches practice four primary activities. And these four activities are just, it was in Acts 2.42, the first church on the day of Pentecost. They, man, as many as were saved, they were baptized and were added to them. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in prayer, in breaking of bread. Later, others were saved. When you see the church in Acts chapter 2, and then you see the church all the way through the book of Acts, and then you read about the churches in Philipp, Philippi or in Colossae or in Ephesus, uh, when you read about them and the letters written to them, what you find is that the, these characteristics, these are things, these activities are the activities of the church. What are the main activities of the church anyway? Worship, fellowship, discipleship, seeing people grow in Christ in their faith, and evangelism. Those four things are the primary, primary activity of every church. If we love the Lord, then we're going to worship Him. And as we worship Him, we also are going to fellowship together because we're in the same family, the family of God through Jesus Christ. And as we fellowship together, then we also fellowship around His Word. We become disciples of His. We grow in our faith. And then we also share our faith. I hope that you'll think about this, that these four characteristics, these four activities are the foundation of all of the other activities in a church. You say, well, you know, our church has Sunday school right there. Discipleship, doesn't it? Well, our church uh, preaches the gospel. Evangelism right there. Our church comes together. We have potlucks and man, we have a good time together. Fellowship. Our church comes together and we sing songs and we, we just pray together. Worship. The four activities of a church in the New Testament are to be carried on by every New Testament church in every place. And that's the way it ought to be. Now, I want you to notice one thing in closing, and that is this, that how the gospel came to the Colossians, how did they get it? Where did it come from? How did they receive it? In fact, <laughs> the gospel was not native to Colossae. It didn't start there. It surely didn't start there. Uh, it had to be brought to Colossae. Remember our map when Ephesus is about 100 miles over there and Epaphras came to Christ and he came back to his town of Colossae about 100 miles away and he began to tell people about Jesus that he had found and then pretty soon people began to get saved and they were, they were fruit of the gospel and then they organized into a church and here you have a church that came from the message of Christ, the gospel being preached, in fact being presented. So how did the gospel come to them? It came to them not through osmosis or not through TV or something else. The gospel came to them from Epaphras. In fact, when he said to them in these verses, in verse six, he says, even as it has been doing also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Man, I love those words and I highlighted them. He said, listen, the gospel has been there since the day you heard it. You heard the gospel. Somebody told you what you needed to do to be saved. And you understood the grace of God in truth. You say, man, that makes sense. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. Christ died for sinners. He died for me. That makes sense, doesn't it? And that by receiving him, by believing in him, his righteousness is applied to me. My sins are carried by him. You know, they're removed by him, his righteousness I receive. They understood the grace of God in truth just as you learned it from whom? From Epaphras, man. That is so, so special. So how did you hear the gospel? How did you hear the gospel? Well, Somebody told you about Christ. Somebody told you the gospel, shared with you the gospel. Um, you are the fruit of someone sharing the gospel. Now listen, you were the fruit of someone sharing the gospel. Who was the fruit of someone sharing the gospel? Who was the fruit of someone sharing the gospel? Who was the fruit of someone sharing the gospel? You understand that chain? 
If you know Christ your Savior, friend, you need to share the gospel with others because you received it from somebody. You were the fruit of somebody sharing the gospel with you. And you are to share the gospel with others. And it goes on and on and on. Just like it goes back and back and back. It goes forward, forward and forward. In fact, it is so amazing when you think about this, that Epaphras was just an unknown person. Epaphras is only mentioned three times in the New Testament, twice in Colossae, once uh, Colossians and once in Philemon. And he was just an unknown guy. Um, but this church was there because he went and shared the gospel. Isn't that something? He wasn't an apostle, wasn't a great preacher apparently, but there was a group of believers, a church in Colossae that was there because Epaphras went and told them about Christ. Man, that's an amazing thing. I love the fact that he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a nobody and anybody can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, I heard somebody say the other day that I'm just a nobody who's trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save. That's true. We are nobodies, but man, we know somebody that can make a difference and we need to tell everybody about that. And you know, when you see that, the Colossians, through the Colossians, the gospel came. And I just love verse six and seven. Look at it. It is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has also been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Through the Colossians, the gospel came to that city because they heard it from Epaphras, who heard it from Paul, who met Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. And God changed his life and he told others and they told others and they told others. And down till where we live today, people have told others about Christ. Man, we need to open our mouths about the gospel, the gospel that saves souls. And so I want to wrap it up by just asking you this. Are you thankful for first your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your savior? Do you have faith in Christ? Are you thankful for your faith in Christ? Are you thankful for your love for the saints, for other people, people in your church, people that are on the other side of the world? Are you thankful for the hope that you have in Christ, the hope of heaven? And are you thankful as you share the gospel? Are you sharing the gospel with others? That's what God wants us to do. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you now and we thank you for your precious word and God, how it just speaks to our hearts in areas in which we need, Lord, we uh, sometimes are so timid and so shy and so embarrassed to tell others about Jesus. And Father, we realize that without Christ, we would be lost forever. But with him, we have home in heaven, a home in heaven for sure. And Lord, I pray that you would use these words from Colossians 1 to touch our hearts, Lord, that, that we would look around us and see people who need Jesus and that we would share Christ with them. We're thankful for the power of the gospel that saves souls and changes lives. And we ask, Lord, that you give us the boldness, fill us with your Holy Spirit, Give us the boldness and clarity to share Christ with others. We love you and thank you for loving us and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.